All right. Hello, Facebook. Uh, this is Tommy Valentine. I have the pleasure of serving as Executive Director of Historic Athens. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us today uh, for this moment in Athens, COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia. Um, all week, we have been starting the first of 55 different interviews as part of an 11-week series seeking to examine the effects of uh, coronavirus across our community. Uh, We'll be talking a little bit later in the program about Historic Athens and how you can get plugged in if you want to get plugged into the general organization. But for right now, the main thing to know is that these interviews are trying to serve two purposes. One is, for those of you that are watching now, today, uh, we're sharing important information that you should know about how to interact with your community safely and productively in ways that um, help moves Athens forward. Uh, also, though, these interviews are being saved. Uh, they'll be contributed to local libraries and research institutions um, as part of an effort trying to document this moment in history for future generations. So as a final note, before we bring in today's guest, uh, for those of you that are listening uh, and, and those of you that have already watched the first few episodes know this, if you jump into our comment section right below this video, um, we can bring those comments, those questions up on screen. Um, and so far, we've been able to get to all of the questions and comments as they've come in. Uh, so I'm just gonna make a note here. Thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, please share your comments and questions below. And so you'll see my comment up here right there. And then if you just want to comment below that, uh, we can bring your questions in here with Commissioner Edwards. So uh, to introduce our guest today, uh, this is Commissioner Russell Edwards. Uh, he's no stranger to any of you in the Athens community, I'd imagine. Um, Russell has served a lot of different roles in this community, uh, but currently, Perhaps his most important role is as uh, Athens Clark County Commissioner for District 7. Uh, for those of us that paid attention during the early days of coronavirus uh, behaviors and protocols, uh, Russell was on the front lines uh, and has been credited with a lot of the energy uh, behind keeping Athens safe and safe in a way that has been distinguished among Georgia counties. Uh, so we're really excited to talk to Russell. We're really excited that he was able to join us in our first week. Um, we're going to go ahead and switch things over and bring Russell on with us. Uh, so there we go. Uh, uh, Commissioner Edwards, Russell, thank you so much for being here with us today. Glad to participate. Absolutely. So um, Russell, I, I mentioned that for a lot of the people tuning in, uh, including I think our, our hosts or our sponsors this week, Gary and Joan Birch, I think they're usually with us every day at one tuning in. Um, I know to a lot of folks in this community, you're a familiar face, uh, but someone might be looking back at this 50, 60 years from now. Um, you know, I know you'll probably still be in civil and public service at that point, but who's Russell Edwards these days? And, and can you tell us about your role in the community? Well, I, uh, I'm the county commissioner representing District 7. Uh, I was elected by my colleagues at the beginning of this year to serve as the mayor pro tem. Uh, so in that role, I, I sort of serve as a liaison between the mayor and the commission at large, making sure that all of my colleagues' uh, concerns are being addressed and heard and uh, providing uh, as much assistance and guidance uh, and help to, uh, to my colleagues as they request or, or desire that help. Um, and trying to do my best within that role to guide the Athens community uh, in the best way uh, possible. Okay, great. Um, we just had one uh, chime in from one of our viewers uh, who said, uh, Jeremy Field says, is a pretty much a lifelong Athens citizen. I appreciate your efforts as well as all the local officials in this time. So thank you, Jeremy. Um, thank you. So uh, Russell, um, can you talk a little bit about how you came to be in this position? I mean, so you've, uh, as I mentioned, you've uh, you've worked in Athens in a variety of different ways. Uh, I'm sure you're having to call on all those experiences in moments like these. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your long-term relationship with Athens? I moved here in 2007 to attend the University of Georgia School of Law and graduated in 2010. And while I was uh, in my last year of law school, I ran for the Democratic nomination for the U.S. House District 10. 
and uh, won that nomination, went on to challenge uh, Paul Brown Jr. for that uh, nomination or for that seat. And that, uh, that really, uh, that experience helped create connections throughout the, the district, but really deep connections here in Athens because uh, folks for the most part recognized that Paul Brown Jr. wasn't working for us in Washington and had a very anti-government posture, which cut off vital federal support for the University of Georgia. You know, the University of Georgia is a, a leading research institution in the world and so federal support in the form of National Science Foundation grants, National Institutes of Health grants, and just general appropriations from the U.S. Congress play a tremendous role in maintaining that leadership position for the University of Georgia. So, you know, I, I, I jumped in, you know, uh, I, I jumped in maybe a little precipitously, but I just simply couldn't stand and, and watch him, Paul Brown Jr., uh, get that seat back without a challenge. And so uh, I, I formed a lot of strong friendships throughout that experience, and I, I lost uh, by a wide margin. 2010 was the year of the Tea Party wave election, mm -hmm. if you remember, when the yeah. Republican took back control of the House and the Senate. So uh, it wasn't, wasn't the right time uh, to run in terms of the broader political climate, but it certainly was the right time for me. And it really, that experience really helped establish uh, the connections in the community that have helped me serve in the long term. So, so I've been active ever you since. You know, Russell, so one other question on this topic, just to try to make sure our audience understands Russell Edwards. So, you know, the first time I had the pleasure of meeting you was 12 years ago now. It was um, on the Bobby Saxon campaign in, in 2008. And that was a campaign with a lot of volunteers. We had, I think at one point, like 40, 50 volunteers. Um, but right away, even though it sounds like you were pretty new to, to Athens in some ways at that time, or at least you hadn't started law school yet, um, you were immediately, I mean, in the 1% of 1% of volunteers that were engaged, that were, you were at everything you were, you go back and look, you're in like every photo. I think that hat or a hat like it was around <laughs> during mm -hmm. those days. Um, but what that means is I think from the first time I saw you in Athens, you were rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty. And this was clearly something that you felt some sense of agency and urgency to do. Uh, wh where does that come from? Uh, you know, wh uh, why why did you feel so empowered and required to work in that moment? I enjoy getting things done, and uh, involvement in local politics can be a source of tremendous fulfillment for those who want to affect change in their lives. Um, the decisions we make on the county commission have repercussions that can be felt immediately, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to local development, zoning, local infrastructure development, uh, local police and law enforcement. Uh, the county commission is tremendously important for affecting the changes that, uh, that are made in, in people's everyday lives. So I, uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy being in the arena of, of political discourse and discussion. And um, it's just a tremendously fulfilling aspect of my own life to be active locally, to try to, uh, to work to affect positive changes. Uh, where it comes from, I, I'm not sure. I, I guess it's, it's something that, uh, that has maybe grown over time through public service and volunteerism throughout my life from a young age, uh, through uh, the United Methodist Church is it from an early age and then on through high school, um, through college, uh, served two AmeriCorps terms in the Frank mm -hmm. Church Wilderness in Idaho for one summer in the Hudson River Valley in New York for another summer. So, um, I don't know, there's a lot of philosophy and wisdom out there that seems to say that uh, if you want to 
feel better about yourself, try to help other people feel better about themselves. So it's sort of a life of service can create fulfillment within your own life. So I, I, I feel that very much. Okay. Well, that, that, that explains a lot. And I guess one thing you've brought up that I also just want our viewers to be aware of is I do think that for those of us that, that are paying attention to politics almost 24 seven, the differences between how some of the levels of our government work are easier to interpret than others. Um, you just did a pretty great brief job of outlining what our city government does, but can you just tell people about what a county commissioner does and, and what your role is? Well, one of the most important jobs we do is pass the annual budget. You know, our general fund is around $130 million and a little bit over half of that goes to the court system, the jail, the police, uh, fire, emergency personnel. So uh, a, a large part of that budget, as, as you see, is deals with public safety. Mm -hmm. And then scaling down from there, uh, public infrastructure, roads, sidewalks, uh, parks, recreation, um, the arts, the Athens uh, Arts Council that we provide funding for, um, the general government staff uh, within the planning and zoning departments, um, we give money to the library. So uh, sort of a lot of the the infrastructure that you encounter every day is what we build. Um, water, sewer, stormwater, um, all of that infrastructure is within the purview of the county commission. So, you know, we, we do a tremendous amount. I know that some of the hot button issues that people follow federally can be exciting and they get a lot of print on national media sources and newspapers, but the county government does a tremendous amount of work that touches people's lives every single day. So let's let's extend the commission discussion in a way that that's pretty timely to what we have. I'm, I'm thinking about Jeremy's comment here. So, you know, Jeremy, uh, we already acknowledged Jeremy's comment. And if you're tuning in, you can make a comment just by commenting below the video. But, you know, he said he appreciates the efforts as well as all local officials at this time. So let's jump right into the heart of this. So, um, Russell, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to trace back how this unfolded to you. But jumping ahead a bit, what is the collaboration like right now going on beyond, between elected officials? You know, those of us who've been watching from the public side of things, we see photos of meetings. We see uh, that there's videos and special called sessions. But um, what's it like to be an elected official in this moment? I think the the local government, the local county government, is is experiencing a moment of high, very high functioning. You know, if you witness that we were the first municipality on the entire East Coast to wow. adopt a shelter at home order, shelter in place, and that that policy passed unanimously. Mm. You know, with the support of staff, which was vital because we pass the policies staff has to enforce it and execute it so that was that was really a tremendous achievement for our local government and uh i think we've seen that manifest in the the press that we've gotten all all across the nation uh pointing to athens as a place where decisive action work in a moment i'm sorry go ahead yeah, the the national press that is that has pointed to Athens as a place where decisive action to put in protective measures for the pandemic, decisive action was was taken and it was successful. So, and subsequent to our adoption of that policy, which was modeled directly from the policy adopted two days prior in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Subsequent to our adoption, eight or nine other municipalities in Georgia adopted the exact same policy. So I think citizens in Athens should really take a moment of pride for 
the effectiveness and the collaboration of the local government to really lead the way in Georgia. Municipalities followed us and adopted the same ordinance. And then a few weeks later, Brian Kemp adopted a similar order that had a, a statewide effect. Uh, similar order, but not quite. It weakened some local protections, unfortunately, in, in certain ways where uh, the beaches were forced to reopen, state parks were reopened. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I think citizens could be proud that Athens led the way. You know, uh, for those of you that are tuning into this, one thing that our regular audience, we've been ur urging them to review, and it, it ties to something that Russell just said. So I'm going to share this link in the comment section, and I'll just show it to all of you here. But um, two years ago, the Red and Black published an article looking back 100 years at the way Athens had handled the 1918 flu. And uh, it's this article here. You'll find it in the comment section. Uh, but one of the things that was so remarkable to look at is that the way that history uh, repeated itself, because uh, much in the same way that Russell just described that Athens had to lead the way, um, and, you know, some people would call that the tail wagging the dog or whatnot. But in, in this case, in much the same way that Athens had to leave the, lead the state in 1918, you see the same thing happening where Athens was far more restrictive, far more uh, moved far quickly, uh, far more quickly to go into lockdown quarantine mode. Uh, some of the safety procedures at the time, uh, it's interesting to go back and look at. The mayor passed a rule that there was no spitting in public at the time, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but the Athens uh, Daily News, the local paper at the time, after the quarantine was over, reported how much better Athens had fared in terms of infection and death than surrounding counties by moving quickly. Um, I'm curious, Russell, when you when you were working to move quickly, did you know that history? Or if not, what do you think in Athens has led history to repeat itself? Well, I think Athens is an enlightened community in some ways, having, you know, hosting the state's leading research institution in two important hospitals, you know, that serve the region. We have gifted, intelligent medical professionals that reside in this county that were ready to provide their expertise directly to us, the decision makers, to help guide our policy in, in the appropriate direction. So, you know, we had the, the University of Georgia Director of Epidemiology and Biostatistics signing off on a letter with the director of the medical partnership between UGA and Augusta University signing on to a letter the two of them along with nearly a dozen other local medical professionals and ER physicians that urged us to take decisive action and adopt a shelter in place ordinance as soon as possible. So, you know, that, that was a tremendous help. The fact that we've got experts here that felt comfortable and at liberty to express themselves widely and publicly to uh, help guide the government to make the right decision. I'm not, I'm not sure every other county in Georgia ha has that resource at their disposal. You know, that, that ability, you know, for me to have the ability to pick up the phone and talk with five or six of the leading doctors in the entire state that live in this county that can then coordinate and draft a letter uh, that that was a that was a tremendous help in getting this policy passed expeditiously you know it, it's fascinating as someone who, who lives in Athens grew up in Athens watching Athens be so involved in this global pandemic uh, you know only yesterday did I find out that it was that two University of Georgia grads who are now at the CDC were part of the team that developed the image of the coronavirus that's now ubiquitous. Uh, you know, I know that uh, one of our board members, Kim Klinowski, is a viral immunologist at UGA and, you know, is working directly with part of the team or that team at the university is contributing directly to forefront efforts on this. Uh, you know, Russell, as you, as you were putting that letter together and realizing how much brain power there was locally did that, that make you feel more 
hopeful about our capacity as a as a species to make it through this moment? I mean, realizing how many experts are on hand. Well, I mean, it, it made me hopeful that we were going to be able to get it passed in Athens. Yeah. But of course, the concern is that the hospitals in Athens serve 17 counties surrounding us and around 600,000 citizens that go way beyond our borders. So, you know, after we passed that policy, the first priority was to ensure that it got enforced appropriately, um, which was a, a little bit of a surprise to me, you know, that that the enforcement would be such a challenge and that it continues to be a challenge. Um, it, it's, it's enlightening to see how important government is at a time like now. I think it's really put in stark relief when you have some folks that are proud to adopt the epidemiological recommendations of six feet of physical distancing. You know, they're proud to do it. It's a source of pride that they're cooperating to help prevent the pandemic. But you've got others who want to disregard whatever the government is trying to promote and distrust and sow dissension, you know, file litigation, you know, try to sue the government. Um, and that, and that, that, that has been frustrating and enlightening and I think really proves to us the importance of government institutions to help at times like these for public health crises where you've got to have broad mandates that can get us as close to 100% compliance with social behaviors because that's the only way that we can help slow the spread of this virus. You know, we can't count on voluntary measures. Right. So we, uh, you know, we adopted the policy here. We, we worked hard to ensure that it got enforced, but then our attention rapidly transferred to our surrounding counties who, uh, you know, and, uh, some of them were making fun of us. You know, people were making fun of Athens, you know, as being the ones that were overreacting. You know, you right. had businesses, in other counties who were gloating and proud that they lived outside Athens so that they could stay open. And right. uh, you know, it just appeared that they were profiteering off of the responsibility of Athens. And there was a lot of angst in the community witnessing that, knowing that these folks were scoffing at us, but they would be coming to our hospitals when they get sick. Right. So you know, with a pandemic, we can do everything we can to be responsible ourselves. But if not everyone is buying in, then it it hurts. Uh, you know, Russell, I want to go back to this idea of um, there's two threads I want to untangle that you just touched on. One is uh, on enlightenment and then one is enforcement. Um, let's start with enlightenment. So my only time out of the house all all week is to do the occasional jog, you know, to run maybe 30 minutes a day. I know some cities have even gone so far as to uh, push back against that. I think Chicago and a few others um, are recommending against that. I uh, also know that there's new research about the slipstream. So whether or not it's even safe to run within six feet of another runner. So that science is changing a lot. But when I am out in the community, one of the things I'm noticing is there a lot of people do seem to have become enlightened probably largely due to the the local protocols put in place by the mayor and commission but i would still say i see one out of every 10 that almost willfully is working against it you know so i mean if i'm, I'm if i'm running out on the street i'll see other people that are you know making room for other people but then i'll i'll usually see two or three folks oftentimes folks that may not be related or uh, may just be friends palling around that are not enlightened yet, that are not taking this seriously, and that are taking that kind of scoff attitude that you described towards the people that are taking it seriously. Um, the hard part is, <laughs> it doesn't take many people like that to clog up our healthcare system uh, if they're not yeah. taking it seriously. As someone who's rapidly trying to protect our system, 
what is it like for you when you see that? And are you seeing that the same way I'm seeing that? Yeah, I see it. I mean, I see it. I see it all the time. I mean, it's, it's frustrating. You know, it's, it, the only thing that the irresponsible behavior is doing is prolonging the pain that this pandemic will bring us. And so, I mean, I hate it. You know, I've got to explain to my six year old yeah. why he has to stay inside while he witnesses his friends playing outside together in groups. I mean, it's, yeah. So <clears throat> it's really hard for folks who have to have those discussions with their kids and um, I think that's why we we probably will end up needing stricter measures, stricter enforcement measures, because we're always going to have some jackass who thinks that this is a, a conspiracy. You know, there's people out there who think that the moon landing was staged and that the earth is flat. You know, we, not everybody in this world understands the importance of social distancing. Right. And so folks they they there have to be stricter measures put in place to ensure as close to 100 percent compliance as possible you know on a temporary basis until we can get a handle on this pandemic and you know we've got folks talking about you know donald trump talking about reopening the economy on may 1st you know that, that's before the peak is supposed to come here in athens so I, I think just the way that this pandemic has been handled by the state and federal government, it really requires now either a vaccine or an effective tr treatment Yeah, because testing and contact tracing has just been a complete failure. I mean, we, we can barely rely on the numbers published by the Georgia Department of Public Health because so few tests have been administered. So I think at this point we're, we're just praying for a vaccine and praying for an effective treatment. You know, we don't have enough protective gear. We don't have enough hospital beds. I read where they opened up an emergency hospital in Albany where they had that severe outbreak, but there's not enough people to staff it because there's a nationwide competition for medical staff. You know, New York and New Jersey and nurses $10,000 a week. So how are we going to be able to get them to stay in Albany to work? Right. You know, it's just, it's just a multi-layered, problem that resulted in the state just sort of passing the buck, Donald Trump passing the buck. You know, you, you can't take an incrementalist piecemeal approach to attack a pandemic. You've got to have strong centralized response efforts. And those have been completely lacking in this nation. And I think that's why we've seen the number of cases that we've seen and the number of deaths that we've seen. It's sad. You know, um, Russell, uh, our guest this week, one of our guests was Deborah Gonzalez on Tuesday. And uh, she unfortunately had just lost her uncle the night before uh, to coronavirus. She had came on the program within 30 minutes of doing a vigil uh, through Zoom with her family for her uncle. And uh, she spent a lot of the time, uh, Tuesday was basically dedicated to grief. So I'm not saying today has to be dedicated to anger, but I know that there's there, there is part of that there. I, um, when I was first trying to get my mind around this and how this was all going to work, uh, I went out for a couple time trials a few days in a row on what had mostly been abandoned, which was the UGA track. And the day that I swore would be the last day that I'd go out there again, I have not back, been back since. There were three other people out there. Everyone was staying two or three lanes apart from each other. And then a group of what were probably college freshmen came out and you could tell that, I mean, they just thought this was a joke. They not only were intentionally running closer to people, but they started running the opposite direction as everyone. So they could kind of run in your face. Um, and I just found myself so angry. I, it, it's so hard to feel. I mean, there's so much anger in this moment. Like you said, you see bucks being passed from the state and federal government. You see people out there openly scoffing. You see counties and, and business owners uh, kind of gleefully making fun of toilet paper shortages or, or active measures. Um, I think for, from the first time I saw you posting about canceling everything and, and a lot of the language you were using, 
it was clear that this was getting under your skin in it, I think in a way that a lot of that resonated with a lot of people. Um, how are you dealing with that kind of anger and how are you channeling it? Um, what's, what's it like taking that on? Well, I've, I've been doing, um, I've been doing a lot of yard work and chopping up weeds. Um, I've got this huge pickaxe that I sink into the earth and break apart stubborn soils. And I have a heavy maul that I've used to split oak logs just to try to get, you know, exercise, but try to channel that frustration into something tangible. I, I mean, it's almost like I, I feel like a pioneer sort of where I'm yeah. you know, chopping wood for the winter and you know, putting in a garden of vegetables and going to build a chicken coop and, you know, sort of back to the earth, you know, it's, it's kind of weird, but, um, you know, I've, I've been very active on Twitter channeling my frustration into pointed questions for the elected officials directly responsible for this situation that we're in. And so for any of the folks following me on Twitter, um, Russell Edwards, I've been, um, questioning Governor Kemp at every step of the way, uh, questioning his staff, uh, providing information to journalists, uh, looking for factual information. Of course, a, a lot of this came to a head last week when we found out from the whistleblower that 10 people had died at Athens Pruitt Grandview nursing home. And, um, you know, what's frustrating there is that we still we still don't know how many people have died at that nursing home. Brian Kemp issued a report two days ago that said nine people had died. So is it is it nine people? Is it ten people? You know, how many people have died in a nursing home and why does it take longer than a week to find out? You know, to me it's just it's absurd, you know, and if we elect people to hold government office who simply don't believe and the authority of the government to help the people, then um, this is this is what we get. And so I think by shining a light on these decision makers who hold these offices and questioning them and staying after them to get them to do the right thing, that uh, that's a good place to channel your anger and frustration. I, I think Twitter statewide is a very vibrant place right now uh, yeah. to question some of our statewide leaders and you'll see a lot of other figures who are active there like state senator jen jordan has been very active state rep scott holcomb has been very active state rep b Wynn has been very active it's 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 refreshing to see that um there are folks out there you know we're not in the wilderness so that, that that's always a comfort to know that there are other people statewide who are dissatisfied. I see this comment from Commissioner Tim Denson. Pruitt Health is saying only seven on their website. So, you know, we get Pruitt says seven. WSB TV says 10. Brian Kemp says nine. So we still don't know how many people have died at Pruitt yeah. Grandview and how many people have the coronavirus. So, it's so yeah, I mean, that must be one of the most frustrating parts about being an elected leader in this moment is that you're trying to make the best empirical decision with the data you have, but the data is all wrong and in ways that you can only suspect. Uh, I hope everyone, as you were watching, saw that we did flash um, uh, Russell's Twitter handle up here. I'm going to throw that up here again, uh, which is just Russell Edwards. Way to jump on Twitter early and get your username, Russell. Good job. Um, we also posted uh, Daniel's comment that he's agreeing with Russell Edwards. Thanks, Daniel, for sharing. Um, I'm going to pull Tim's back up here, uh, Commissioner Tim Denson. He's going to be one of our guests on a forthcoming interview. Uh, but let's let's talk about data. So what, what is your relationship with data right now? What is it like to feel like you have one eye covered? It's, I mean, it's horrible. It's just, you know, the the downplaying and the minimization of the pandemic coupled with the ineffective rollout of testing is, is just a disaster. 
you know, the extreme under testing. You know, up until a few days ago, we were only testing symptomatic individuals who required hospitalization. So we know there's an extreme undercount in this in this state. But now we're talking about reopening the economy and lifting the shelter in place even before we've reached the peak. So I think, you know, this crisis reveals who people are, you know, it really brings out the best and the worst in people. Yeah. And, you know, right before we put our shelter in place, I got phone calls from people who were on their way to the gun shop. And I got other calls from people who were wondering how they could help and who they should give a contribution to, to support food distribution. Uh, I think we've seen the worst from Governor Brian Kemp. Uh, I think we've seen his uh, small government ideology reflected in the way that his government has responded to this pandemic. You know, at first it was, it's up to the counties to do what they want to do. Athens acted and then his staff ridiculed Athens for overreacting. Then he did the same thing almost that Athens did, a weaker. So it's just been a complete inconsistent mess coming from the state. And uh, it's been, it's been a, tr a tremendous frustration. It's, it's really made me feel ashamed to be a Georgian, honestly. You know, I've got friends who live in other states who are just scratching their head. You know, what, Russ, what, what's going on in Georgia? I mean, that's an embarrassment, whatever's going on there. So I felt, Russell, you know, I, feel, I felt ashamed to be a Georgian, but let me be clear. I, I feel proud to be an Athenian yeah. because I feel like the people in Athens at large have really banded together and done a great job to do what they can, whether it's crafting protective equipment out of cloth, like community, the shop in downtown Athens, or the emergency food distribution from the East Athens Development Corporation, or the food distribution conducted by Hugh Atchison, the chef of Five and Ten, or Epting Events food distribution. You know, so many businesses and people are really banding together to help fellow Athenians. So I'm I'm very proud of Athens, but I'm very ashamed of Georgia. Yeah. Um, uh, Russell, I just shared. Uh... I think it's Mary or Marie, sorry, Marie, I guess, uh, Marie's comment. Uh, Marie, thank you for sharing that with us here and with Russell. Um, thank you, Russell, for Russell's leadership. Um, Russell, I wanna, uh, both for the contemporary audience, but also for the future audience here, uh, I think folks around our age grew up there, you know, there are all these zombie movies, right? Zombie movies all the time. And, and the, the, the trope in a zombie movie is the the protagonists gradually realizing the world's about to change you know like these news reports they're ignoring in the background and then someone gets sick and you know it's like this noise that gradually gets louder until you can't ignore it anymore and i think for those of us that grew up with that fiction we saw that reality play out where uh this this gradually just crept and crept and then exploded uh and a lot of the people i talked to either it was just because they finally had the bandwidth to pay attention or whatever, talk about spring break, UGA spring break is the period of time where it really exploded on the, the local scene. But for future generations looking back, can you walk us through how that, that creeping sense crept up on you? Because you were one of the first to be urgent about it. How did you know to be urgent? You know, what did that, how did that unfold for you? Well, I, uh, I was in Europe in early February and uh, on a business trip and um, and I started reading reports about Italy and France and um, and I was watching all the hundreds of people packing into the Louvre thinking to myself, there's something bad that's coming here. And when I came home to America, I just kept reading and reading and reading and reading and reading and reading. Um, and it, and yeah, it was, it was right around spring break. You know, we decided uh, as a family to stay in Athens for that spring break. And, and we did a lot of reading all that week and then ended up closing the shop 
downtown on uh, the Friday of spring break because the cases were rolling in. I think Georgia maybe had two or three cases at that point, something like that, maybe four or five cases. And um, it was just too risky. I mean, people were coming into the shop. We didn't know where they were coming from. There wasn't any sort of virus protection at that point. There was no testing, really. There was no response, really. Right. So we closed the shop, and um, and I started talking to my colleagues and started talking to Mayor Gertz. And um, one thing I've, I've been thankful for is that the mayor and I had been on the same page. You know, he he did his homework as well, and he understood that this was a risk that needed to be addressed right away. So we called uh, an emergency meeting on Monday after spring break, right before St. Patrick's Day. And um, I, you know, I was pushing and crying and trying to get a curfew uh, put down. Uh, was unsuccessful, but we did get a, uh, a limit on public gatherings of 10 or more. So that was tremendously important to get that in place right before St. Patrick's Day. And then that following Friday, we enacted the mandatory shelter in place. So, you know, it was probably from that Friday when we closed the store, it was about two solid weeks of work from sunup until 11 p.m. at night every single day. Um, A lot of time on the phone, spreading the word, talking to my colleagues, uh, talking to as many people as I possibly could you know, about the dangers of this pandemic and how we've got to act here to help ensure the safety of our population. Because one thing that's beautiful about, or one, the, the, the grand benefit of shelter in place is that it protects people regardless of what other government responses entail. You know, regardless if the state government does nothing, regardless if the federal government does nothing. A strong stay-at-home order, if nothing else, protects citizens and encourages citizens to practice safe behaviors that will save lives. So um, I think that point came across crystal clear, you know, in the community. A a majority support was built behind it, and then unanimous support was built behind the commission. But it it took a lot of work. I mean, it was was relentless. What did it feel like? Right before we went on air, I talked about some of the the early, I, I guess it's fair to call them memes, but some of the images you made urging people to cancel everything. And, th- you know, this was at a time where that wasn't common knowledge yet. I know that we were, you know, as an organization, our nonprofit was really struggling with some of our upcoming public programming. We had three public events we had to rapidly cancel. I know that's true across nonprofits and organizations around here. Um we were set to go on a vacation. We had to cancel. I mean, there there was just so much getting canceled. But you you really slammed into motion there pretty early with cancel everything. What what did what did it feel like in that moment that was kind of producing that? I mean, it was it was a clear sense of urgency. You know, I wanted to do everything in my power to prevent the transmission of this virus. And so I remember that Friday night. You know, there was, there was uh, I think, two or three nights sold out at the Morton Theater for the Acro Cats. And so I was on the phone with the attorney and the city manager and, and Kelly Gertz, and we, we canceled the Morton, you know, that night, that very night. And uh, it, it was really just, you know, I was emailing the YMCA, you know, trying to get them to close. You know, as a member, I respectfully request that you please close your doors to the public to prevent viral spread. And, um, you know, absent a broad mandate, I just worked as feverishly as I could in a piecemeal way going, you know, from one institution to the next to, to, to try and prevent large public gatherings where super viral spreads could occur. You know, we saw in Doherty County around Albany where two funerals resulted in a huge outbreak where now they have the, some of the highest concentration of COVID cases in, in the world. So, I, you know, armed with that knowledge of how this virus spreads, I knew very early after reading reports that, that it could spread six feet in the air and water droplets in your breath and that 
it could live two weeks without showing symptoms in your body. So that right there, I mean, it's just tremendously dangerous the way that this virus acts. And so um, armed with that knowledge, I, I, I knew I had to act and do as much as I could to cancel as many large public gatherings as I could. So I first focused on the Morton, got the Acrocats canceled, uh, focused on Sine, and uh, sent a lot of emails through to Sine. And then, you know, Saturday night, I got a, a call from a whistleblower in the Georgia Department of Public Health that told me there were two cases in Athens, the first two cases. And I, I didn't feel comfortable waiting for that information to come out at noon on Sunday. So right. I went ahead and shared it on social media Saturday night because I thought to myself, well, shoot, maybe that will prevent somebody from going to some big church the next morning. Maybe they'll think twice. Maybe somebody's life will be saved. And so I, I just went ahead and released the information and, and I'm glad and glad that I did. You know, you know, Russ, it, it deserves access to, to transparent, accurate information as soon as possible. Russell, what I, what I want to ask here briefly is, um, and you know, I know we only have about 15 more minutes together, but uh, so many, what I'm hearing throughout your discussion is so many times where you're being pulled in, in multiple directions. So, I mean, you hear a lot about the stress this is causing on small business owners. And here you are talking about your small business. Earlier in the discussion, we asked you about, you know, where you developed this public service service ethic. And you talk about uh, your relationship with the church. But then, you know, as you just mentioned here, you felt this urgency to get that information out before everyone was going out to church on Sunday and accidentally getting infected. Um, have you felt pulled in multiple directions here? Has it given you more clarity? What's it feel like to have to wear multiple hats in this moment? Um, I, I, the strongest pull I feel is public health. You know, what, what are the strictest possible measures we can put in place to ensure the greatest lives being saved? Yeah. And, and, and it sort of goes hand in hand with, with everything else, because the stricter we are, the shorter the pain will last. You know, it's the half right. measures that really prolong this thing. And that, and that's right. really been the source of a lot of frustration for me because, I, you know, closing our business down, closing our storefront down and having to work from home and uh, has put a tremendous stress on my family, you know, because my son's at home too. So we have to ensure that my son gets educated and has a fulfilling life while maintaining the livelihood of our business. Um, yeah, it's hard. Um, but it would be a lot easier if everyone would adhere to a strict regime for a few weeks. You know, the, the studies show that if we could just implement a two or three week lockdown, where everyone participates and everyone cooperates, then we will hasten the end of this pandemic. But we've done everything we can here in this county. You know, and yeah. Governor Kemp issued an order allegedly usurping whatever we do, and the federal government hasn't acted either. So it's just, it's just very, I mean, it. That's that's why I go out in the yard and plant flowers because when I go too deep down this hole, it, it is tremendously frustrating to be an elected leader for a county government where I feel like we've done as much as we can to attack this pandemic and to help protect our population. But it's the irresponsible leadership of others in positions yeah. of power in our state and federal government that undermine our local efforts and actually extend the length of the pain suffered by the responsible Athenians. And, and that's something that just, it, 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 dry, it drives me up the wall. It's, it drives me crazy. Well, uh, Russell, bear with me one second here because I want to get into that crazy for one for the few minutes we have left. But uh, just briefly, uh, what we have to do is just very quickly thank the folks who made this possible. Um, so uh, we're going to do that in just a moment. Uh, so first of all, this week was made possible by the donations of Gary and Joan Birch, <clears throat> who are also annual sponsors. These are the sponsors that support Historic Athens. Historic Athens is a 501c3 nonprofit for over 52 years, 
We've been working to celebrate and conserve community heritage in Athens, Georgia. Sometimes that means physical spaces, but sometimes it also means increasing historic awareness um, and doing education advocacy work. We also operate the Athens Welcome Center and Hands on Athens. Um, but we do appreciate all our annual sponsors uh, and donors. Uh, if you'd like to become a donor or a donor member, membership starts at only $5 a month. Um, and you can find out more about sponsorship or membership at historicathens.com. I'll tell you, I was just talking to someone else from the nonprofit world earlier today. The biggest challenge is trying to find the right balance of strength reminding you we're going to stick around and that we're here to serve you, but also not being afraid to let you know that we need you. So um, every dollar counts so that we can continue our operations. Uh, uh, but also if you have any thoughts on how we can do better, just visit historicathens.com. You can get a hold of me. Um, thank you there. Um, we have uh, 10 more weeks after this week of interviews. So that's, that's 50 more interviews with people around our community. We're really looking forward to that. Um, next week is sponsored by... Dan and Corey Delamater, uh, and we really appreciate their support. Um, so I want to transition, Russell, to what I anticipate will be the last three questions. Here's the first one. Um, so I'm going to bring up on screen a different image, not a sponsor image. I'm actually going to go ahead and uh, get rid of me because I'm the least important thing here. Um, yeah. Did we lose Tommy? I forgot. I forgot that if you can't see my face, you can't hear me. So uh, I tried to <laughs> pull myself off. But um, anyway, uh, let's see here. Let's try this. Okay. So Russell, here we have these two images. Uh, can you reveal the identity of your model in these memes? That's my son Teddy. That's your son Teddy. Um, so these were some of the first images I saw. Uh, pop up in my feed, urging people to stay home. And so I, I wanted to bring them up, A, so that people could see them and that you were trying to combat this with some sense of humor and urgency at the same time. Um, but I, I can't help but ask, I'm a parent, you're a parent. What's it like being a parent in this moment? Can you can you tell us and our viewers, both present and future? It's... Uh... You know, again, I think I think the hardest part of being a parent right now is having to teach those lessons uh, to your kids, <laughs> lessons of fairness, justice, responsibility. And those lessons come in stark relief when your son is inside the house and he looks outside and sees groups of kids in the neighborhood playing together. And he's asking, Daddy, why can't I go outside and play? Um, so it's it, that's, that's been hard, you know, because there's only so many things you can do to entertain your kid. I mean, golly, it gets hard sometimes, especially if you're trying to run a business and and uh, serve the community on the commission. You know, my wife is is really the force behind our local business, and she's been working tirelessly to keep it going. Yeah. And then I've been working on the commission. So between those two, you know, trying to ensure that our son continues to lead a fulfilling life, it's a challenge. And, um, you know, to have other parents disrespect the dangers of the virus and allow their kids to play outside in big groups and run the neighborhood. And almost like, why, why, why are you making this harder on the people who are being responsible? So it's, I think that's been the most frustrating part of being a parent in this crisis is having to, having to teach those really hard lessons to your kid that, well, sorry, but our neighbor is, is making it worse for all of us, right? You know, they don't respect the law. You know, the folks in our in our neighborhood. Sorry, not all of them are going to do what's right. So, um, I guess those lessons are always hard to teach. You know, so I probably I probably should just get over it. You know, and and I will. 
I will get over it. And I, and I am pretty much over it because I know that there's so many other folks in this community who are dealing with so many more serious problems of securing shelter and food and the resources they need to just survive that for me to complain about, you know, having to teach hard lessons to my son, it seems a little, seems a little okay. silly, a little quaint. So. Well, it's, it's, a, I'm sure it's a lot to grapple with. I know we're feeling that over here too, where she had friends she was seeing at the library and at music class and all these other places she can't see them anymore. And um, watching your kid be lonely or confused is tough. Um, Russell, this isn't one of the last two questions I wanted to ask, but I, it's something that just occurred to me while we had this up. Um, I noticed that on the first image, you listed this part that says shop online. Uh, can you, for those tuning in, if anyone wants to support uh, your business, can you just tell us how we can do that? Yeah, sure. You can uh, go on Instagram. Uh, the name of the business is Agora Vintage. And, um, you know, it's a great shop on Broad Street downtown. We sell fashion accessories and a little bit of everything. Um, so if you go to Instagram and search for Agora, it should pop right up. It's Agora underscore vintage. Um, and uh, and you can communicate with us that way. And it's very much a conversation back and forth, helping to find maybe something that will brighten your day. Very uh, good. Um, and uh, I saw that uh, we obviously want to give credit to Lindsay for saying, uh, I appreciate your realness, Russell, right there with you. And m most importantly, uh, tell him Teddy. Uh, so we need to get some tell him Teddy t-shirts out there. Um hey. Here's that Agora, Agora link, um, Agora underscore vintage. I think you said Russell, right? right. Um, so uh, Russell, the last two questions before we get off the line, um, ones we've been trying to uh, ask um, each of our guests. Um, so first is, you know, this is a time where we are able to support uh, a lot of our local businesses through curbside pickup or things like that. But I also know it's a time where we're limited some, you know, I can't go get a Waffle House uh, all-star special right now if I want to. I can't go uh, to the place for brunch on Sunday or Blue Sky for a beer. Um, when the, when shelter in place steps back, you know, whenever that is, uh, complicated by many of the things we've talked about on this interview, um, what is something you're looking forward to doing again? What's something you miss right now? Uh, I miss eating out at the patio at Calendito's with my friends. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my friends who, who have kids that are Teddy's age, you know, it's just such a fun place to go get good food and have the kids play and, and visit. So I'm, I'll, I'll definitely hit that up. And then I'll, I'll also certainly be hitting up the bar at the national, which is one of my favorite places to go. Mm -hmm. I, Peter Dale is such a, gifted chef but just a real pillar of the community and a great athenian so i always love to support peter and enjoy everything that he creates yeah absolutely that's our my for my wife and i the date that we typically do that we can't do right now is go to cine and then as we're processing whatever we just saw go to the bar at the national next door so that's uh on the list for sure um russell the last question i have for you before i just open the floor for you to close us out is um you know, we have a wide mission. Part of that mission is historic preservation. One of the things that's a big topic of conversation right now in the historic preservation world is that typically when communities step out of a recession, they're so eager for growth that you're more likely to see historic resources be bulldozed, compromised, um, just in the name of capital G growth, you know? Um, and so we're trying to speak to each of our guests and ask them, what are some of the historic resources in this community you prize? What are some of the things that you hope are protected for years to come? Uh, anything come to mind, Russell? Well, I definitely, two big ones come to mind. You know, first, probably being downtown. You know, we have one of the most beautiful historic downtown districts in the entire nation. So I'm, I'm, I'm very keenly aware of, of protecting those assets to the fullest extent possible. You know, they've, many of those buildings have been around longer than 100 years. So we need to think long and hard before we erase that from the, from the landscape. Uh, number two would be some of our historic five points neighborhoods. 
I, I just think there's some beautiful architectural examples and styles all throughout Five Points. So I've, I've really enjoyed uh, participating with citizens in that area to protect places like Millage Circle. And then now uh, Oakland Avenue is up on deck for uh, yeah. some other protections. So it's going good. That's great. Um, yeah. And we've been very excited to hear from the HPC about the Oakland developments and, and look forward to being able to help communicate that value to the community as that's moving forward along with downtown. So Russell, um, I'm going to close the same way we've been closing every uh, day, which is, um, uh, and by the way, if you're looking, if you enjoyed today's interview, you can tune in all next week and every weekday until June 26 at one o'clock here on our Facebook page. Um, but Russell, uh, 50, 60 years from now, 100 years from now, if some researchers looking back at this interview, what do you want them to know about Athens in this moment? I want them to know that Athens led the way on the East Coast with pandemic protective measures. We were the first municipality on the entire East Coast to enact a shelter in place ordinance to help protect our citizens. And that that ordinance turned out to be a model for many other municipalities in Georgia and helped really lead the state to enact a policy that, that pr protects its citizens from the pandemic. So Athens, Athens has a lot to be proud of. Very good. Well, Russell, I want to thank you for being here with us. We want to thank Gary and Jen Birch for making this week possible. We hope that you all, and, and Russell, thanks for all the work you're doing to support our community. I know you've supported us in the past in various ways. Um, I, I hope we get to see you at the gala again this year. I hope we get to have a gala this year. Um, we know that when we have discussions about things like Porch Fest this fall, we know that that'll only be possible if the mayor and commission keeps up this good work to to help our community move forward. So please keep up the good fight. And we really appreciate you um, doing everything you're doing. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Edwards. And we will see you all again very soon. Be safe. Thank you. Have a good